Welcome to Experimental, the science show that makes slugs crawl on razors and explains why women cheat on men. In a moment, we'll be off to Japan to give fish a little acupuncture before they're eaten. Tasting the strongest chilli in the world and having one of those fantasy moments with the bloke off the bus. But first, let's find out why women fancy thugs once a month. Liverpool, England, famous for its football, cathedrals and music. Yeah, it's the hometown to the Beatles and all that love, love me do stuff. And that's why Experimental has come here. We're looking for love, but not at the Cavern Club. We're heading up to the university to find out why it is that women change their minds about the one they love once a month. Meet Rob Burris of the University of Liverpool. There has been some research that's shown that women, when they are in the most fertile phase of their cycle, are more likely to go out to a singles nightclub without a male partner and uh, to, to go there in more revealing clothing. And women have also been shown to fantasize more about uh, men who aren't their partner and also to, to sleep with men who aren't their partner more frequently during this um, fertile phase of their cycle. That's right, boys. Once a month, that normally loving partner of yours may think about straying, especially if she sees something big or butch. Apparently, this is totally understandable, according to Tamsin Saxton behavioural biologist at the university. In evolutionary terms, when you're picking a mate, you're picking somebody who can help you have healthy children. And that, you're looking for two distinct things. One of them is somebody who can help, who can give you resources, so who can maybe provide you with presents or money or, or give the same sort of things to your children. And the other is somebody who can give you healthy genes, because if your children have healthy genes that can deal properly with the environment, then they're going to grow up and be healthy and strong themselves. That's right, guys. Women want two things, even if they don't know it. On the one hand, they want a man who's going to stick around and change the nappies. But once a month, it seems they're only interested in one thing. Hunky men that will produce hunky children, even though they'll never be around to push the pram. And it seems it's not just women who can spot a rugby shirt once a month. Rob Burris believes that men, too, have a subtle biological clock that changes as their partner nears ovulation. To prove it, he created a number of faces, which he hoped would typify the extremes of masculine and feminine features found in male faces. A masculine face is usually typified by quite a strong jawline, um, thinner lips and a wider nose, generally lower down eyebrows. And conversely, a feminine face will have the opposite features, so uh, larger lips, a thinner nose, a bigger forehead, bigger eyes. And during the uh, most fertile phase of a woman's menstrual cycle, she'll be more uh, interested in masculine-faced men, uh, while during the rest of her cycle, she'll be more interested in feminine-faced men. So that's the women. But do blokes become more interested in masculine faces at certain times of the month, too? To find out, Rob took a group of men who were in relationships and tested their ability to notice the masculine features in the photographs. And we just got these men to rate the faces, rate these composites uh, for dominance on a scale of one to seven. And then we're able to compare between men whose partners are in the fertile phase and men whose partners are in the non-fertile phase, the average scores they gave to these dominant and submissive faces. He found that men, like Steve here, were more likely to notice the more masculine faces in the pictures if their partners, like Julie, were ovulating, suggesting that a subconscious awareness of their partner's fertility has set them on a course to become jealous of these potential love rivals. Jealousy can be a very useful um, thing, but it can also be very dangerous. So if a person's overly jealous, then that can lead to their relationship being dissolved, and, um, and of course, no one wants that. So. Um, it pays men to be most, well, I'll say most sensitive, most jealous, when their partner is most likely to cheat. So be warned, girls. If all of a sudden that ugly thing in the rugby shirt looks great, he won't in a day or two. Worse still, if you make a move, that normally placid boyfriend of yours might get all butch. 
and do something silly. Still to come on experimental, super fresh sushi in Japan and what not to do on an electric fence. But first, the test department will attempt some vivisection. Poor old Billy Bunter has had an accident shaving. Still, while swooning under the tender ministries of his lady friend Karina, he has an interesting thought about razor blades. It can be summed up in this simple question. If you take one slug and ask it to crawl across one razor blade, will there be one slug or two at the end of the process? Shall we see? First, is a razor blade sharp enough to cut a slug in half? Well, if it can do this to a piece of chicken, then the answer should be yes. Next, we need some apparatus in the form of the Slug Tester 3000 machine, a simple construction of two platforms connected by a razor blade. On one, we shall place a fine example of the species Arion hortensis, or garden slug. On the second, we place a piece of its favourite food, lettuce. Now, will our slug brave the razor blade in search of the lettuce? It's a tense moment, but after a brief examination of the blade, the slug is off! The reason a slug is not cut in half by the blade is because it never actually touches it. Slugs secrete a sticky mucus which they glide over. So although our little slug here can go over the razor blade quite happily, it's actually cheating. In a moment on Experimental, the source of the world's strongest chilli. But first, a bit of sushi acupuncture. Fish is more than just a food in Japan. They're a national obsession. They like them fresh out there, so fresh they don't even bother with the cooking bit. They just chop them up and serve them out. But that's not enough for this man, Toshiro Orabi. He wants his fish so fresh, they all but swim onto the plate. When I went to Osaka, which is a big city, I could never eat the fish there. Because I grew up next to the sea in a fishing town with beautiful, clean waters, I was afraid of the fish in the city. Orabi believes that even if the fish are transported alive and kept in restaurant tanks, the stress they are under taints their flesh, making them, in his opinion, inedible. One day, whilst watching TV, he had one of those rare eureka moments that most inventors can only dream about. The programme was about acupuncture and he remembered back to when he used it to ease a back problem. The needles had certainly relaxed him, and perhaps they could have the same effect on the fish too. Uh. Although it's hotly contested, some Western scientists believe that acupuncture works on the central nervous system, closing off certain neurological gates and blocking the pain impulses from parts of the body. It's widely used as a form of anaesthetic in China, and Orabi wondered if he could adapt it to keep fish in a state of torpor whilst they're being transported. So I needed to know the basis of fish biology and how they live. When I knew all that, I just had to try spiking them here and there and, well, all over. After I tried it on 2,000 fish, I eventually found the right point. His technique has been so successful, it's led to a whole industry. 
I'm using the needle on this fish to put it to sleep, but it's a company secret, so I can't show you how. There you go. So, just like that, it's now asleep. But it's not dead. It can still move its mouth and gills. Although more like an aquatic frontal lobotomy than the sort of acupuncture we humans subject ourselves to, Orobi claims that his technique is based on the same principles as the Chinese art and simply puts the fish into a state of torpor. We wanted to ask the fish, but he put the lid on the box before we could. The reason Orobi spikes his catch is that once knocked out by his needle, a sleeping fish can be transported anywhere in the world, but remain so relaxed that their flesh tastes exactly the same as it would if it had been plucked out the sea that morning. And well, it could do. It's long been known that stress has a huge effect on the quality of pork and beef. A relaxed animal will have a lot of sugars in the form of glycogen in its muscle fibers. If the animal is ill-treated or gets a fright just before slaughter, its increased muscle activity causes a sudden drop in the glycogen and results in pale, flavorless meat. The same may well be happening with fish. But if so, will the flesh of Urubi's needle-relaxed fish taste any better? Well, there's only one way to find out. We decided to put Urubi to the test with an experimental taste challenge. The fish on the left has had the acupuncture treatment. The one on the right has been taken from the restaurant's storage tank. Will he be able to tell the different fish apart? OK, let's give it a try. This one first. This is my fish, and the one here is the standard fish. Well, on the basis of that extremely scientific test, I think we've proved that spiked fish do taste better. Still to come on Experimental, the world's hottest chilli. How to imagine yourself doing this, and how to light a fire with water. But first... It's an idyllic day in the countryside and you're out with the kids for a walk. Suddenly, your little lad wants to get a bit closer to nature. Go behind the bushes, son. And evermore, you're racked with guilt. Because you never told him about the dangers of peeing on an electric fence. But just how much damage would little Johnny have done to himself? Here, in the test department, we're trying to find out. Meet little Johnny number two a slightly modified shop dummy with an anatomically incorrect appendage. The idea is to measure the amount of current that would reach the delicate bits of a real live Johnny, hence the crocodile clips and voltmeter. So, we have a surrogate human. What about the wee-wee stuff? Where does that come from? Well, the test department does have a ready source, but for reasons of taste and decency, we cannot show it. So now for the experiment. A stock fence is capable of giving a whack of up to 10,000 volts for around 0.3 milliseconds. But just how much of that voltage will be able to travel up our sample and hit Johnny where it hurts? Let's see. Oh! Little Johnny just got a jolt. Not enough to kill him or even do any lasting damage, but more than enough to make him walk to the public toilets in future. In a moment, we'll be camping with the test department and sniffing in Canada. But first, let's find out who it is you share your body with. Bobby here is a fairly typical Western male. He's about six foot tall, 
and his skin covers an area of about two square meters. That's about the size of this blanket. Although Bobby considers himself Mr. Clean, he shares his body with quite a few others. His hair will almost definitely be infested with microscopic follicle mites, despite the shampoo. His mouth will have about a hundred species of bacteria living there, despite the tooth brushing. Go deeper and you'll find his gut contains trillions of bacteria. On the outside, his skin is home to about a million bacteria per square centimetre. But don't worry, Bobby, most of them are friendly. And there is one place in your body where there is no bacteria. It's inside your bladder. Despite its dirty toiletry associations, urine is usually completely sterile because your kidneys filter out all the nasties. Before we leave the experimental labs, there's still time to find out what to do with a dampened campfire and experience a few smelly fantasies from Canada. But first, to the heat of the subcontinent. This little green shriveled thing is believed to be the hottest chilli in the world. And this is Patrick, who rather stupidly is going to eat it. Whilst our hapless tester is being put out, we figured it would be a good idea to try and track down the source of this killer chilli. We had hoped this would mean a ticket to an exotic location in the tropics. But it turned out to be a trip down the road to green and grassy Dorset in southwest England. That's right, these humble polytunnels house what is claimed to be the hottest chilli in the world. The Dorset Naga, a chilli so hot that it almost qualifies as a chemical weapon. But who'd grow these tongue killers? These two, Joy and Michael Michau. We didn't try to grow the hottest chili in the world. It just sort of worked. And it's, it's, it's as I say, it's a, the best kept secret in the world. Only Joy, me, and 60 million Bangladeshis knew about it, really. It all started when Joy and Michael bought their first Naga seeds from this man, local greengrocer Mr. Khan. Naga chili come from originally from Bangladesh. You cannot get it anywhere else. And they are really, really, really hard. Uh, I know them for more than 15 to 20 years and uh, they're very hard, but despite the hard, they have some nice flavour, which is we people like it, you know. Mr Khan's naga seeds seemed to like the Devon soil. They grew big and strong and were soon sprouting strange shriveled fruits that to an aficionado are most pleasing to the eye. This is what, for me, is the ideal naga that we want. Sort of long, thin, wedge-shaped, for me, it's, a, it's an incredibly attractive chili. Uh, the trouble is, there's a bit of beauty in the beast. It's lovely to look at, but it really is hellish. So hellish that Michael and Joy decided to send their chili to America for official testing on what is known as the Scoville scale. It's the chili equivalent of the Richter scale for earthquakes, starting with naught for the sweet Italian pepper and ending up at 16 million for pure capsaicin, the chemicals in chilies that gives them their hotness. It was invented by Walter Scoville in 1912 and is based on a panel of testers tasting chili essence in a sugar and water solution. The idea is to keep diluting the chili until the taster can no longer taste any trace of it. Normally, the test is done with a panel of five testers, but with Patrick still being cooled down outside, only Horace was prepared to do the tasting. Amazingly, his results were much the same as those from America, where the Michaus claimed they got a rating of 970,000 Scoville units. This would make the Dorset Naga over 300 times hotter than the jalapeno pepper, and almost twice as hot as a habarino pepper, which scores a paltry 500,000 Scovilles. However, it's still not quite as strong as the pepper spray used by some police forces. That clocks in at over two million Scovilles. So you have been warned. Yet to come on Experimental, 
This woman lounging about on the sofa. Mm. But first, let's sizzle in the test department. Being a freezing cold day, this little test department demonstrator has decided on a spot of girl scoutery, with a crackling fire and a sausage on a stick. Unfortunately, there's always someone out to spoil the fun. But wait a mo. You can put out a fire with water, but you can also light one with the good old H2O. Unfortunately, you also need the sun, which is conspicuous by its absence. So we've decided to cheat with a rather large light. Good. Let's get on with the demonstration. First, whack a steak into the ground. Then, fill a plastic bag with the wet stuff and tie up the top, so you've created a bubble of water, which you can then hang from your steak. With a bit of tweaking, you should be able to use the water bubble as a lens to focus the sun's light, just like a magnifying glass. Enough to start a fire. And it works in practice too. Look, there's some smoke and... Yes! Amazing! We have fire! Well, no, actually. Although it worked fine in rehearsals when the sun was out, it clouded over when we went to film and our big light simply wasn't strong enough to light our fire. So our demonstrator had to revert to that well-known chemical reaction called... a match. Oh, this is completely unacceptable. Either you do an experiment properly or you don't do it at all. Try this at home. Ah! What it does is it creates a prototype robotic. What's the difference between reality and imagination? Is thinking about a bottle of champagne or a nice fur coat or even that bloke from the bus the same as really having that bloke from the bus? You don't think so? Well, you might be wrong. You see, according to the work being carried out at the Montreal Neurological Institute in Canada by Dr. Yelena Georgievich, as far as the brain is concerned, real and imagined are pretty similar, at least when it comes to olfactory imagery or smells. Basically, our main goals with the brain activation study was to see uh, what regions in the brain are activated with olfactory imagery. The team believed that the same regions of the brain would be involved whether we were thinking of the smell or really smelling it. To find out, they stuck their subjects in a PET scan and gave them a whiff of something like... Strawberry. Only Dr Georgievich had a trick up her sleeve. Sometimes there was no smell of... Pine. But when hearing the word pine, amazingly, her subjects not only smelt it, but their brains reacted in the same way as they would have had the smell really been there. So it seems our brain can faithfully recreate the scent of a nice new coat, but can it recreate its feel, or for that matter, the feel of the bloke from the bus with the same effect? Does the same part of the brain used for real sight and touch light up when they're just imagined? This was um, very consistent to what other researchers have found in other senses. For example, in vision, in audition, with the sense of touch. But why is the brain so good at imagining reality? Well, one idea is that it's the mechanism by which we make sense of the world. We can imagine the rewards for a course of action, and that might spur us on to take that action. But we can also imagine the consequence of failure. And that might deter us from doing something stupid. But as with so much of the human psyche, whilst our powerful imaginations may have evolved to keep us safe, we can also use it simply to have fun. But remember, keep your thoughts to yourself. <laughs> <laughs>